Chapter 12 covers conducting sample surveys, which are used for things like political polling or how to measure customer satisfaction on a new product. One thing that we've covered before, but it's especially important in this chapter, is the fact that when we talk about a population, we're talking about everyone. And when we talk about a sample, we're talking about just a part of that population, a part of a whole. When we want to gain insight about a population, examining everyone in the whole group is usually impractical, if not impossible. Think about polling a presidential election. Uh, it's not possible to go to every voter in the country and ask them who they're going to vote for. Instead, we settle for looking at a smaller group of people called a sample. And as long as this group is randomly selective, selected and representative of the nation as a whole, it should give us an idea of how the entire population will be voting. Sampling is a natural thing to do. Think about someone who's making a soup. It's not necessary for them to eat the entire pot of soup to determine whether or not it tastes good. They can eat a bowl of it or even maybe a, a spoonful of it to determine uh, whether or not it tastes good. That's as long as the soup is sufficiently stirred up. Same idea with sampling. We want to randomize our sample. Uh, we could put all the names in the hat and draw them out randomly, but more likely we'll be using things like a random number generator or random number table like we did in chapter 11. When a sample accurately represents the population, it's said to be representative. If it's not, we use the term biased. There's usually no way to fix a biased sample, so we have to be careful when we collect our actual data. The number one most important thing to keep in mind when we're trying to create an unbiased representative sample is that we need to select individuals at random. Randomization is absolutely essential in every uh, accurate, valid sampling method. And the reason for it is that if we don't include randomization, uh, we could end up with something like a lurking variable, which we learned about in unit two, or something called a confounding variable, which we're gonna learn about in the next chapter, chapter 13, uh, where, our sample ends up biased in some way. So randomization just makes sure that on average, our sample ends up looking like the population as a whole. One thing that's kind of counterintuitive is that it's the size of the sample and not the size of the population that determines how accurate our predictions will be. For example, let's say we wanted to take a poll of the New Jersey governor's race. So we randomly select 1000 people who live in New Jersey. And let's say at the same time we're polling the presidential race, we randomly select 1,000 people who live across the United States. We'll get just as accurate as predictions for both of those polls, despite the fact that the population of the United States is a lot larger than the population of New Jersey. It's the size of the sample that's important, not the size of the population. The only exception to this is that we always want to make sure our sample size is a maximum of 10% of the population. A common question is why not just go out and sample everyone? In some cases that's possible if we were talking about uh, the students at High School South, for example. Uh, if we were to do that, that would be called a census. That's when we sample the entire population. Uh, the United States government tries to do this every 10 years. It's actually called the census. Every household in the country gets mailed a census form. Uh, they send census workers out to these households who don't return their form to knock on the door and say, you need to complete your census form. They also send census workers out to find um, homeless people. They go to areas where homeless people live uh, to try to document how many homeless people are living in the country, things like that. Point being that it's very difficult to complete a census. Populations rarely stand still. By the time a census is completed, the number of people in the country has changed people have died, people have been born. Uh, and in a lot of cases, this one in particular, taking a census may be more complex than sampling would. One more bit of terminology before we get into the different types of sampling. This is actually something that we touched on way back in unit one, and we haven't really come back to since then. When we're dealing with populations and we have a numerical value about the population, that's referred to as a parameter. For example, 34% of all Americans own their homes. That's a made up parameter. I don't know that's true, but since we're talking about all Americans, the whole population of Americans, that would be a parameter. A value that's referring to a sample, a numerical value about a sample is called a statistic. Uh, 2000 people were polled on the presidential race and 48% of them said they're going to vote for candidate A. That's a statistic because it's talking about a sample of 2,000 people and not the whole population of voters. 
We use Greek letters to denote parameters. Those are the values on the right here. And Latin letters to denote statistics. All right, so there are a lot of different types of sampling methods. The most important one is called a simple random sample. Emphasis on this is on the simple. Okay, this is the equivalent of putting everybody's name into a hat and just picking out random names. Okay, this is the best form of sampling uh, in the sense that we're going to use this in many of the other methods that we're going to discuss. If we have everybody's name in a hat and we're picking out names, first of all, any individual person can be selected. And along with that, any group of people can be selected. If we pick out 10 names, we might get 10 females. We might get 10 males. Uh, if we're picking out 10 names of people from the classroom, we might get the 10 people who sit in the very front. Okay, there's no uh, criteria that's splitting up who we're picking. Okay, we might get differences. We will get differences uh, if we were to repeat this process and do different samples. This is called sampling variability or natural variation, natural sampling variation. This next type of sampling is called stratified sampling. Both this one and the next one are similar in the sense that we're gonna start off by breaking our population into different groups. Now, let me give you a, an example uh, of our question. So let's say we're polling our high school on how well uh, students would rate the cafeteria food. Okay, so we would use stratified sampling in this situation because we might uh, expect that there's different groups within our population that have different opinions about that question. Namely, maybe freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors might have different opinions. Seniors are more likely to go out because they can drive. Freshmen are more likely to eat in the cafeteria because they're stuck inside. Uh, so our first step would be to break students into those four groups. Okay, those groups are called strata. Okay, the strata contains similar subjects in the sense that all freshmen are in one group, all sophomores are in another, but the groups themselves are different from one another. After that, we're doing a simple random sample, that's what SRS is, on each group. So randomly select 50 freshmen, 50 sophomores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so the benefit of this is that we're kind of forcing representation from all four grade levels. We won't, uh, if we were to do a, a simple random sample, we might uh, just by chance end up getting all freshmen or all seniors. Stratifying makes sure that we get representation from all four of our grades. This is gonna reduce the variability of our results across repeated sampling. So if we did this a number of different times, we should get more consistent results because we're always gonna have 50 of each grade level, even if those 50 freshmen are different, 50 sophomores are different, um, because we're assuming that those groups are gonna have fairly cohesive opinions of the cafeteria food. Okay. The last thing is that when we do stratified sampling, we can notice important differences among the groups. So maybe we see that uh, freshmen prefer the food, seniors don't, or maybe we don't see those differences at all. Cluster sampling is similar. Again, we're splitting our population into groups, but this time we want to split them into groups because they're the same instead of different. So it's stratified sampling. We had groups that were different freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. St uh, cluster sampling, let's say we want to use gym periods. Okay, there's eight gym periods. Each of those gym periods are going to have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Okay, in cluster sampling, we're randomly going to select one of those periods. We randomly pick a number. We pick three. We go to third period and we perform a census on that entire period. Within that period, we're expecting it to be fairly representative of the whole population, okay, because it does have representation of all four grade levels. So it's just easier for us to pick a gym period, go into that period, uh, and survey everyone, rather than have to do simple random samples on uh, all the four different grade levels. Okay, a st cluster and stratified sampling are not the same. We stratify to ensure that different groups are represented. Clusters are already largely the same. Each gym period at least is assumed to have representation of all four of our grade levels. So we randomly select one 
uh, and then just perform a census on all of them. In a systematic sample, we're sampling items or individuals systematically, meaning that we're doing, say, every 10th or every 15th subject. Okay? We always need randomization, so we're going to randomly decide which person we'll start with, and then we'll pick, say, every 10th person after the randomly selected number. And lastly, multi-stage sampling. This is just when we start to combine different methods together. All right, example, we need to survey a randomly sample of 300 passengers on a flight from San Francisco to Tokyo. Name each sampling method described below. A, pick every 10th passenger as people board the plane. A reminder, we would run, randomly start this at a specific number. This would be a systematic sample. B, from the boarding list, randomly choose five people flying first class and 25 other passengers. Okay, you should notice that there's groups here. Okay, the groups are first class and other passengers. Okay, now the question is, are these groups the same or different? They're different, okay, and we're also not performing a census on either of these groups. This is gonna be stratified sampling. We break them into groups. We do a simple random sample on each of these groups. Part C, randomly generate 30 seat numbers and survey the passengers who sit there. This is just a straight, simple random sample. You can get any 30 passengers, maybe they're all first class, maybe they're all not first class, maybe they're all uh, in the very back of the plane, etc. cetera. And D, randomly select a seat position, right window, right center, right aisle, etc. Survey all the passengers sitting in those seats. Okay, again, this is a grouping. Since that runs down the whole length of the plane, this will have representation of first class passengers, uh, coach passengers. Uh, since we're doing a census on everybody in that group, this is a cluster sample.